There's this old Greek legend called the Legend of the Gordian Knot, where Alexander the Great visited the city of Gordian, and they presented him with this knot. And they told him, if you can figure out how to solve it, we're going to let you rule the city. So what he did, instead of trying to solve this complex and intricate thing, is he took a sword and just cut it. And that was very controversial. As you can see, everybody was like freaking out, like, whoa, how'd you do that? And in modern day, we have somebody just like that in the scientific community. And his name is He Dring Ki. I'm going to call him HJ from now on, for simplicity. Over the past week, he's become one of the most controversial figures in the scientific community because he became the first person to genetically edit a human cell. Now, when I say first, there's an asterisk there because technically, we've been genetically editing humans for a very long time, using things like zinc fingers and tailings even before CRISPR-9, Cas9. But what makes this case special, HA's case special, is the type of cell that he edited and what he did with those edited cells. So there's two types of cells in humans. There's somatic versus germline cells. Where somatic cells are the most common ones. So think skin, liver, hair cells. And these have a characteristic of being non-heritable. So any changes or mutations that happen to these cells aren't passed down to offspring. So for example, if I get cancer right now and I have a child, that child won't have cancer. On the other side, you have germline cells. And these include your gametes. So for females, that would be the eggs. And for males, those are the sperm. And these are heritable, meaning any changes or mutations to those genes are passed down from generation to generation. And that's exactly the type of cell that HJ edited. He was approached by a family from China who were worried that their children would take a, conceive HIV because of an HIV epidemic. And what he did is use CRISPR-Cas9 microinjection to target a gene called HIV-1 within the genome of, those, of two different embryos. He then inserted them into the mother, and nine months later, they've become full-grown healthy babies. And that's why this is so controversial, because what HJ basically did is he created this whole new lineage of artificial human beings that are now resistant to HIV-1, and their children will be resistant to HIV-1. And there's a lot of ethical implications. People are saying, what if we have designer babies? What if we create this enhanced, enhanced species of people? But when you ask a scientist, the more important thing they look at is the practical implications of all this, because Cas9 thing that he used, the complex that he used, is not a perfect system. There's a lot of flaws, uh, mainly to do with the effects it will have on the person, because we don't know what every part of the genome does. So just removing the HIV-1 gene could leave those babies vulnerable to something else. But we also, uh, there's other things like mutations, because after the gene is cut, it has blunt ends, so that means there could be mutations when it's trying to, when it's trying to fix itself. So scientists started looking at homologs, which are basically different species of different bacteria that all have CRISPR-Cas complexes that we use for gene editing. The main homolog which was used for Cas9 is called Streptococcus pyogenes, and that's the one that's super famous. But they also found another one called Acidaminococcus sp, which codes for a CRISPR-Cas complex called Cas12a. Now, Cas12a has promise because it promises to solve a lot of the problems that we see in Cas9. I decided to use a program called PyMol to model Cas12a. And here you can see the blue part, that's your protein, that's the complex itself, that's Cas12a. And inside you have the genome running through. I'm going to make it a little more clear here, so I've taken out the surface from the model and you can see the alpha helices and beta cheats. Inside, your green is your cRNA, that's your basically your crosshair, that's what tells the complex, oh, look for this part of the genome. The pink is the genome that you're trying to edit. And on the end of the pink, you have these red tips, and that's where your denucleases, or the scissors within the genome, actually make the cut. Now, the process of how Cas9 and Cas12a work are very similar. Cas12a is actually kind of simpler because it has less components. It doesn't need something called a tracer RNA, which is this add-on that helps Cas9 usually find its genome. It can actually go straight to the part, to CRISPR locus, or that genome that you want, and take it out and use it for targeting which makes it overall very simpler and efficient in some cases. Also, there's this thing called PAM sequences. PAM sequences are called are proto-adjacent, proto proto-spacer-adjacent motifs. And that's a mouthful, so I'll just keep saying PAMs. And these are basically the flags on the genome that tell Cas9 or Cas12a, come here, you can edit the gene here. Now, we have a list of these depending on the homolog or the type of Cas complex that we have here. And by adding Cas12a to this list, we've essentially doubled the amount of genome we can edit. We now have twice as much uh, editing room on the genome. We can go to genes that we've never thought of targeting before. 
because of CRISPR Cas12 A. Now, there's also something to do with how the genome is cut. So, CRISPR Cas9 ends, uh, ends the gene editing by cutting and making blunt cuts. And the problem with that is when the, gene, when the genome is trying to come back together, it could actually cause mutations. Cas12 A actually makes staggered cuts, which facilitate the bonding and make it easier for the DNA to go back together, lessening the chance of mutations. There's also the case of, of Cas9 specificity. Of Cas9 specificity. And that is basically a fancy word for accuracy. So for example, when you have Cas9 and when it's trying to bond, it's, it's, it makes really strong bonds. And that's a problem because now, even if there's inaccuracies in that target genome, it could still make that bond to it. And that means it could bond to the wrong thing cut out the wrong part of the genome, and that could have really bad effects. Cas12A actually has weaker bonds, meaning it doesn't need to, it, it needs more correct alignments for it to connect, so it's more chance of it being accurate. And you can think of it in a really cool analogy. Think of superglue. Superglue has a super strong bond, and that's your Cas9. You can just add it anywhere, you don't need to put it in all the correct spots, and it's gonna bond. On the other hand, your Cas12A is your Velcro. Even though it has a weaker bond, that means it it, it, it's more accurate because now you actually have to align the Velcro properly for it to do its bonding. And Cas12 A isn't just some theoretical thing. We've been using it for quite a while now. It's just, it's being overshadowed by this Cas9 phenomenon that we're seeing around the world. It's been used in mice embryo to try to edit them, and it's actually been used in human cells to solve some problems with muscle dystrophy. And no one here is saying that Cas12 A is going to overtake Cas9 and become this whole new gene editing thing. But it's just one extra tool in our genetic editing toolbox that will lead to a practical, ethical, and safe future of genome editing.